The second bank of the United States' principal legal function was to serve as the official bank of deposit for all federal government funds. But the provisions of its charter in 1816 told another tale, because the charter actually gave the Bank of the United States the potential to turn into the kind of aggressive and functional central bank for the entire American economy, which the National Republicans were yearning for. The bank's charter gave the Bank of the United States important economic clout. The Bank of the United States was a peculiar organization in that it was a mixed public and private enterprise. The bank's charter had planned to found the Second Bank of the United States on a capitalization of $35 million. But the federal government was only capable of contributing one-fifth of that capitalization. The rest had to be raised by selling shares in the bank to private investors. Therefore, even though the Second Bank of the United States was primarily the federal government's bank of deposit and paid the federal government interest on its deposits and dividends on its profits, private citizens could also purchase shares in the bank and sit on its board of directors. This meant that the bank was free not only to act as a bank of deposit for the government, but also to pursue investment policies in private corporations. And it had capital reserves which dwarfed those of any other financial institution in the country. Now, from the point of view of the Democratic Republicans, this was precisely what was wrong with the bank. Not only did this single institution have more power than any single institution could safely be trusted with, but that power was based on money which, technically speaking, belonged to the people of the United States. And there was something terribly askew in the minds of Democratic Republicans about a bank which used the people's money to thwart the people's will as expressed in Congress. To Andrew Jackson, the Second Bank of the United States had become a national monster by its concentration of overwhelming political power in a few hands. And a year later, Jackson raised to Congress the ancient and more fundamental objection to the Bank of the United States that Congress had exceeded its powers in the Constitution by granting the bank its charter and that therefore the entire Second Bank of the United States system was unconstitutional. Far better, Jackson hinted, far better to create a simple deposit system for federal funds, whose financial stability would be founded upon the credit of the government and its revenue, rather than on the dividends generated by Biddle's ambitious scheme of investments. And Congress, Congress was filled with representatives, including Democratic representatives, who were either entangled in Nicholas Biddle's webs of obligation, or, like Henry Clay, defended the bank as an outright benefit to the nation. What Clay had not counted on was the violence with which Jackson was prepared to issue his veto and fight for its enforcement. According to Jackson, the Bank of the United States represents a mistaken and unfair grant of special privileges to a wealthy elite because the term of the bank charter grants it an exclusive privilege of banking under the authority of the general government and a monopoly of the foreign and domestic exchange. The people of the United States need to be aware, Jackson warned, how the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes and make the rich richer and the potent more powerful. And when that happens, Jackson announced, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. Now the solution, as Jackson explained in the veto message, was to dismantle these concentrations of power and especially any governmental agencies which looked like making the rich richer, and returning 
the unconstitutional authority they had usurped to the states and to the people. Well, the Democratic newspapers whooped in joy over Jackson's veto message. Because Jackson had used the veto message to identify the Second Bank of the United States with every anxiety which the penetration of the world markets had aroused in Americans. Now you notice there was no talk here of a nation united in the pursuit of Republican virtue, as it might have been back in the days of Hamilton and Jefferson. Instead, what Jackson was laying out here was a scenario of class warfare, with the democratic mass pitted against a conspiracy of the aristocratic few. By drawing a line between liberty, the people, and economic equality on one side, and special favors, foreign oppression, and the bank on the other. But Henry Clay kept on laughing reassuringly to Nicholas Biddle. Clay in the House and Daniel Webster in the Senate at once rose to call for an override of Jackson's veto, with Webster denouncing Jackson's veto and, and it was a veto, mind you, of a, of a routine piece of legislation. That was a miserable piece of personal politicking. And both Webster and Clay pointed to the need the West and the South had for credit and currency for further development. And here was Andrew Jackson reaching down from the heights of the presidency to smash this. But not even the fabled eloquence of Henry Clay and Daniel Webster could stem the tide which Jackson had unleashed in the veto message. And on July 16th, an attempted override in the Senate could only muster a bare majority, 22 to 19, rather than the required two-thirds for an override. Jackson's veto had only killed the recharter petition. The Bank of the United States still had four more years of operation guaranteed to it by the original 1816 charter. And under normal circumstances, there would have been little that Jackson could have done about it. But the bank war over the recharter had decisively altered the circumstances. And Jackson was now willing, once the re-election campaign was over, to go on the offensive against the monster bank. Jackson's principal objective was the $10 million in government deposits in the Second Bank of the United States. Withdraw those, Jackson reasoned, withdraw those, and the bank, already politically weakened by the loss of the recharter, the bank would be economically weakened as well and unable to wield the influence over Washington City, which had protected it up to this point. The bank's charter, after all, had made the second bank the government deposit bank unless the Secretary of the Treasury authorized deposits to another institution, and even then the Secretary had to get approval for that from Congress. And even if Jackson had put hesitation on this issue behind him, others in his cabinet and in Congress had not. Jackson turned to his longtime ally in the bank war, Attorney General Roger Tawney, and made Tawney Secretary of the Treasury, and this time it worked. On October 1st, Tawney cheerfully ordered all future government deposits to be made in seven state banks, while all future withdrawals for payment would be made from the Bank of the United States until the federal funds in the second bank were completely exhausted. Announcing that the withdrawal of the government deposits was threatening the stability of the Bank of the United States, Biddle now began recalling loans he had made and shortening credit by five and a half million dollars. As Bank of the United States creditors came up short, Biddle seized businesses and property, while other borrowers found Biddle unwilling or unable to extend further credit for business operations. And so businesses failed, workers were thrown out of work, and the money supply dried up. Determined to make the country hurt and to blame Jackson as the cause, Biddle hoped to choke submission out of Jackson and the nation. Go to Nicholas Biddle, Jackson snarled to pleading businessmen. We have no money here, gentlemen. 
And when Congress adjourned at the end of the summer of 1834, without taking any more dramatic action against Jackson than the censure resolution, Biddle was forced to back down, ease credit, and allow prosperity to return. Unwilling to let the seven state banks, the so-called pet banks of 1833, acquire too much power of their own, Jackson increased the number of authorized state banks, authorized to receive government deposits, to over 300. He scrupulously paid off the federal debt and arranged that the resulting surplus in the treasury of $37 million be parceled out to the states. And above all, he tried to nudge the nation back to the exclusive use of specie, of hard coin, and away from the use of paper banknotes by issuing, on July 11th, 1836, a specie circular, which required that federal lands in the West be purchased only with hard coin. Federal land sales, as we saw in one of the earlier lectures, were one of the key elements in the development and expansion of American settlement. So, to make land sales, especially federal land sales, to make those and limit those only to the use of hard coin was in effect to make the use of paper banknotes impossible in one of the most important segments of American economic exchange. And if he could drive banknotes out of that sector of the American economy, then it was entirely possible that people would take that conclusion and run with it and begin driving paper money out of the economy in other sectors.